Okay, so uh, it is 1020. So let's go ahead and continue on. Um, hopefully everyone has gotten a, gotten up and gotten a little break and we will continue now. Um, <clears throat> so uh, now I'm going to be talking about data storage and some uh, best practices for sharing. Um, there will be some topics in here that might be a little bit more advanced, um, but Mostly, try to make. I'm trying to make sure that everything is um, at least you know uh, useful to new users, even if you don't have a ton of HPC experience or experience using different storage options. Um, but again, you can always ask us questions, put things in the Q and A um, if if it's unclear to you. Um, so first, I'm going to go through all of our file systems, and um, uh, Rebecca did mention all of these, but we're going to go and start talking about them in a little bit more detail. Um, so you remember seeing this uh, uh, slide before, um, you know, Perlmutter is just one part of, of the whole system. We have different, different uh, you know, connections and all kinds of different services, and uh, a lot of it is storage. Um, so we're going to talk about all of these different storage options, what are the differences, uh, why would you use one versus the other, and so forth. So basically, one way to look at our storage is as kind of a hierarchy in terms of kind of two different dimensions. One is performance, so how how fast is it? Um, and then the other is capacity, so how big is it? Um, and so the, the most performant would be if we could have everything in memory, because that just sits right next to the CPU and is really, really fast. Um, but that isn't the case. We can't really do that. Um, and so we have Scratch, which is uh, basically considered local. It's it's con connected to Perlmutter, the, the, the system, uh, directly. Um, and so that means that the uh, the data speed is really high. I believe on this slide it says it can be up to five terabytes per second. Um, so these, these uh, red connections here and the numbers here uh, mean how fast the connection is. And uh, so that's why we say our Scratch system is the most performant because the data rate between Scratch and Perlmutter uh, is, can be up to five terabytes per second uh, versus the ones that are a little further away that are connected via the internet. Um, those, uh, and when I say further away, I don't mean like physically, those are all basically in the same place, but uh, I just mean, you know, over the internet. Um, those are can be a, a little bit slower and would be used for for different reasons because of that. So performance is really about how kind of uh, the the data rate essentially. Um, we actually have more than thirty six petabytes. I think this is probably closer to like forty or forty five now. We actually added more, um, but each person pretty much gets uh, twenty terabytes to start. Um, and the main thing to remember, and I'm going to say this probably 10 times during this presentation, is that Scratch is a temporary space. So we do purge files on Scratch that haven't been used in, I think it's eight weeks. Um, so what I mean used, I mean it hasn't been touched, uh, hasn't been interacted with in any way. Um, and so this is not a permanent place to put things. If you, we were going to, we're going to talk about some more permanent um, options. Um so this, just just keep that in mind, that things in Scratch um, are not permanent. It's meant to be used when you're actively doing some kind of computation because it's very performant, but then you need to move your data somewhere else. So one place that you could move it is to our uh, community file system. So the community file system is very large um, and it's not as fast, which is why we don't recommend running from community file system. You can, it still will be good. Um, you may not even really notice a difference. I probably wouldn't, but um, it depends on what you're running. It may, it, it is a little bit slower, but it's our kind of second best option. And it's, so it's, it's not, I mean, it's semi-permanent. And when I say semi-permanent, it's because if you're, when you're a user, um, you have access to that space because you're on a project. If the project doesn't get renewed, um, each year projects have to get renewed. Um, or if you're a user and you're not, you know, using it anymore, um, like if you, if you get removed from a project, then you may, you may lose access to that data. So when projects don't turn over for the next year, we, we tell PIs and everybody in that project to remove their data so that they have access to it because otherwise they may lose that access. 
Um, then we have our archive. And so this is a tape archive and I actually have a video later I'll show you, but this is a huge, huge amount of space. It's for long-term storage, it's very stable. Um, and you can put data that you need to keep that is kind of like, uh, we, you know, we finished this paper, or we finished this project, you know, you need to keep the data because you, you might need to refer back to it, but you probably don't need it now and you, you may not need it for a while. So that's where you can put data um, for kind of long-term storage. That's why we call it archive. And it's meant for large files. Um, so if you have a bunch of small files, you need to combine them into kind of a larger, uh, like a tar kind of, you know, zip type thing um, in order to uh, archive them. And we have instructions on how to do that specifically for using this tape archive. So I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I will show some of that here. Um, and then we have two other kind of storage spaces. Um, one is our global common software. So this is a place that is um, and we're, I'm going to show you later, but it's mounted read only on our compute nodes, which means that when you try to use software from here, it can be very fast because, um, because of the way that it's mounted. Um, so this is a good, it's a small space, but it's a good place to put uh, software and it can be shared uh, among uh, definitely people in your project. Um, but I think, and now I can't remember, I was just trying to do this on Friday, but there might be ways also to share it across other projects. Um, but don't quote me on that part. It definitely is something that you can share in your project. So um, if you, uh, you know, if you're, you have a condo environment that works really well for your, what your, your type of research and you want to share it with a fellow student or a collaborator and they're on your project, they can access it because if your content environment lives in global common software or, or some other executable lives in global common software, they can also use it. Um, so it's a good place to do uh, that kind of stuff. And then there's global home. This is, I, I again, my, with my analogies, it's kind of like the, the, the entry space of your house. So it's a place that you might want to, you know, Put your shoes but you're not going to like unpack your entire bag into your your foyer or into the entry space in your home so it's a place where you can keep a couple things that you might need to reference quick things but it's not where you're going to store things um the the quota so the amount of space you have in your home is very small um so in general our policies are that we we do provide a way to store manage and share data um so we that is part of our our job is to provide that for you. We have a lot of amazing people who do that and, and support that. Um, these are intended for active allocations. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, if your allocation, which is basically that project ends, um, you will need to move your data somewhere so that you can have access to it. We don't, we won't keep it for you uh, long-term. <clears throat> uh, PIs can uh, request modification, deletion, transfer, um, uh, to other systems, um, you know, that are associated with their award. So we can help you with that. Um, and then we have Unix permissions that are based on different Iris user IDs and groups. Um, so it's actually um, your responsibility to check if the permissions or whatever you need um, are okay for the way that your data is stored. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, like who can see what, for example, Scratch is just yours. Um, I it's possible that people can see Scratch, but they definitely couldn't uh, like actually uh, read or write or anything like that. Um, you'd have to give them permission to do that. But then the community file system is a little bit different. Uh, people can definitely read and write, uh, maybe probably not write, but I think they can read files uh, in, in the community file space if they're in your project. Um, so uh, while we do offer, you know, a lot of support and help, and you can always ask us questions if you're having a problem, um, you know, it, it, we, we really want you to take responsibility for your data, for backing it up. And that's why we go through and try to explain our policies and our different options so that you can make a good uh, judgment of how to manage your data. Um, so <clears throat> now I'm going to, again, just keep going further and further into detail about each of these systems. Um, so global home, like I said, uh, it is permanent, but it's very small. Um, and it's, it's not meant for any type of performance. You shouldn't be running jobs out of your home directory. Um, it's just a place to, to keep a couple things, some source code, some shell scripts, just, just like that. Uh, nothing more than that. And so the way to access it really easily on our system, if you're in the terminal, you would just use CD, change directory, and you can use the um, uh, alias or uh, variable that we have set up for you, which is uh, 
access by you doing a dollar sign and then home, um, and that will take you to your home directory. Um, also, I'm not watching chat, so hopefully Rebecca and or Charles are able to um, keep an eye on that for me. We have it covered. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, so then our like I uh, I've talked a little bit about our community file system, so um, I, it's permanent while you have an allocation. Um, so if you again if your allocation ends or you're not on the project anymore, you shouldn't consider it permanent in that regard. But if you have an allocation, then it's going to stay there. It's not doing the same thing like with Scratch, which has this uh, limit of like around eight weeks. If you haven't used a file, then it, it may get purged. Um, but it's a larger space and it's it's fairly performant. Um, so it's not a bad place, especially if you, for some reason, aren't able to, you know, you need more space than what your Scratch um, has, um, then it could be a good option for you. Um, uh, oh, I forgot to mention Bash snapshots. So we um, take snapshots of the storage systems every, uh, every day and you have access to up to seven days of snapshots. So what this means is um, it's sort of, it's a, <laughs> I mean, it's not really version control, but it's essentially like, um, you know, what what did I have yesterday? And I don't know what time it's at, so I can't say like every day at noon, um, you know, we take a snapshot. There probably is a time, but I don't know when it is. Um, but it, it, it's just a way if something goes wrong and you're like, oh, no, I deleted a file I needed. You can always try to go back and look at these snapshots and, um, you know, get access to the thing that you needed that you lost access to for some, or deleted by accident or something. Um, so this is a really good place to share data within your research group because it is um, your whatever's in there is accessible to everybody in your project. Um, so if you want to share things with your collaborators or so forth, this is the place to do it. And you can access it similar to home, CD, change directory, and CFS. Um, that will take you to like the top level uh, community file system. And then you can do slash backslash and the, your project name. Um, so you would enter like M, uh, you, a lot of them start with M, not always. Um, and then sometimes there's numbers, uh, but it could be something like that. And you'll, you'll know what your project is. If you don't, you can use Iris to find out. Um, and then there's Scratch. So uh, Scratch is, is large and it's very well optimized for um, uh, read, write. Um, so it's, but it's not optimized for like long-term storage, like we said. So it doesn't get backed up. And the purge policy is eight weeks. So if it, in eight weeks you haven't used something from there, um, it may get purged. Not necessarily, but I'm pretty sure that's um, kind of what you should expect. So you should operate like, hey, if I'm not using this and eight, eight weeks go by, it, it probably won't be there anymore. So it's really good just for setting up your data and performing computations. But then, you know, you need to have a plan for where to move your data afterwards um, if you don't want to lose it. Um, as I mentioned, the long-term storage option is our HPSS, High Performance Storage System. This is basically an archive, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's basically uh, tapes. Um, there's a big tape system, and I, I thought I had a video of it here, um, but actually I'll show you what it looks like, and there's cool little tape robots that go around. If you need to access the data, they can go and get it and read it for you. Um, so, okay, let's see. Uh, why do I have this here? I don't have this here. Um, so in this, um, again, you know, we just, we really want everybody to know that Perlmutter, or sorry, that, that Scratch is purged. Um, we, it's really important to us that you remember this so that when you come to us and you're like, Hey, my script is gone or my thing is gone. Um, you, you know, there's, you know, you, you may remember that it's not permanent and it never was. Um, there are quotas. Um, so everyone gets 20 terabytes. Um, if you go surpass this, um, you may not be able to use uh, the, the system to write more data until you move things around. Um, so I keep saying, hey, you know, you should be running things in Scratch. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you uh, so you know, if you're curious, what does that mean? It means move your run scripts into Scratch, and then when you submit your job, and again, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. So if this doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Um, but you're going to submit your script from this Scratch space, um, meaning you everything is living in there, and then you submit your job there. Um, I'm going to skip that for a moment. Okay, so. Um, then we talked a little bit about this global common software. Um, and so this, this plot here is showing 
the um, uh, read performance. Uh, I think it's read read uh, benchmark. Yeah, I thought this was the read time. Let me look. Yeah. Um, and so what you would want here is for these numbers to be small because you want it to be fast, right? So you want the amount of time it takes to, to access the whatever information is there to be really, really quick. Um, sorry, one moment. Let me deal with the noise pollution over here. Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, and so you can see here, so Shifter, we're, I, I can't remember, Charles, you have to remind me if we're going to talk about that tomorrow, but Shifter is um, our containers solution. Um, and so this is really, really fast, and that's a good way to um, provide software to other people or to use it for yourself. It's very performant. And then the next is common. So if you put your, like I was saying, if you put your software stacks in common, uh, which are mounted read only in, on Perlmutter, on the compute nodes, um, it will be very fast and, um, you know, will help you with your, um, uh, you know, making your computations go faster. Um, then you can see, um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So I went through that. Um, so remember, uh, the community file system is meant for uh, large data sets um, that you need for a longer period of time. And these are group readable. Um, and so if you, if you need to change that, you can, um, but that's the default. Um, and yeah, it says it's not for intensive IO. Um, you, you still can, like I said, uh, or like I showed, it still has about 150 gigabytes per second in terms of the data rate. So it's, it's, it's still pretty fast. It's not five terabytes. Um, so depending on your space needs, you could run um, uh, out of CFS instead of Scratch if you really need a lot of space to run whatever it is you're running. Um, so again, the way to access that is to use CD. Um, you can use this uh, dollar sign CFS and then your project number. Um, and then you can make, make your directory however you need to. Um, so I have linked here the uh, more information about the community file system um, so that you can uh, understand how best to use it. Um, I'm actually going to skip this for now. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is my little video. I, wanna, I love showing this. This is a little robot that goes through, and these are all the cassettes, the little tapes. And I'll get this. And then it goes around, uh, this little robot does, and it picks whatever it knows, kind of like the address of the tape, and then it will put it into a place that it can be read. So so now again, this is why you don't want to be using this for active compute. It's a place where I put my data, it stays there for a while, and then you might need to read it later. And then at that point, when you read it in, you might want to move it to one of the more performant places if you need to use that data for some reason. Uh, because it, as you can see, it's a physically very like, a slower process. Um, okay, so I've talked about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's really important that you understand what the home directory is because this can sometimes cause problems. Um, it's it's a place for small scripts and a small amount of data. The, the quota, so the amount of space you get in your home directory is 40 gigabytes. Um, so it's pretty small. Um, it fills up really fast, especially if you're doing Conda environments. Conda just, you know, so Conda is for using uh, Python and actually it can, it can do other things, but it's used commonly for Python. Um, uh, it, uh, it just like downloads a bunch of stuff and can kind of clog up your home directory. So we actually now have, uh, we suggest not using your home directory for that reason. Uh, because the 40 gigabytes fills up really fast. And then what happens is if you go over this quota, you actually can't log in anymore. Um, and so what you need to do, or you can't log into um, certain parts of the system. You can log in, I'm sorry, you can log in, you can't run jobs. That's what I meant to say. You can log in, you can't run jobs until you clear your quota space a little bit. Um, and so it's important to understand if you're trying to run a job and it worked yesterday and it's not working today, double check your quota. Um, and the, the command to do that, and I thought it would be here, but I, um, I'll i double check, it might be somewhere else in here, um, but it's actually, you can just type in show quota on Perlmutter and you'll, you'll be able to see your quota. Um, 
And then I did mention these snapshots. So the snapshots are a really great way to uh, double check if something, you know, you needed something and it it didn't didn't survive accidentally deleting or something like that. You can go into your snapshots directory, and then um, you can copy your sna whatever snapshot you want um, back into your home or maybe into your your um, uh, scratch or wherever you want to move it so that you have access to those files again. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. So, so DPS is, uh, a special thing on our system. It's an IO forwarder and, um, it, it requires a little bit of special usage. Um, so this is a lot of text, um, but I'm just going to try to give you the high level highlights of this. Um, so in order to, uh, again, use the system in the best way. Um, you, you may not really have to think about this or worry about it too much. Um, because if you do these things, you just, it won't be a problem. You know, you won't, you, you'll get good performance and, and you won't see any issues. Um, so for example, like we said, um, Conda environments should be in a container or in global common software. Um, if you install them in your home directory, it just makes a ton of, uh, it, it can cause a lot of problems if you're trying to run at scale. It can work really well in small scales, but then it becomes a problem at scale. So that's just the best practice. Um, and so you won't have any issues. Um, in general, if you can run out of scratch, again, this, this DBS thing, this IO forwarder will just do its thing in the background and you don't have to worry about it. If you need to use CFS because the amount of data you're generating or using for some reason is really large, we have a special amount of CFS that is optimized to um, work well with this DVS system. And so when you go to uh, specify a file path somewhere in your code or so forth, instead of using the global mount, you can use this DVS read only. That's what the RO is. So DVS read only mount of your um, uh, of your project directory and whatever configuration or files you need. And again, that will speed things up a little bit. Um, and there's just one last point here about ACLs, um, not to use them. I, I don't even know what ACLs are. So um, if you do, don't use them. Um, okay, so uh, I'm sorry, we're, I think we're okay on time, but I have a few more slides. Um, yeah, okay, because um, I won't uh, need more than 30 minutes and then we can do the hands-on. So take your time, you're okay. Okay, okay, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> so so sharing files, um, there's a couple of different options. So I think we've mentioned this, if you're working with other people, you know, just in your project, you can um, use uh, CFS. Anything that you put in CFS is group uh, readable. Um, and uh, actually, is it group? I don't know. There are parts of it that are writable, but I don't think you can go in and mess around with other people's files. Um, I need to double check all these these permissions because it's different and there's different defaults in different places. But you can definitely go in and um, see other people's files, and you can copy them over if you need, uh, you know, to to access them. Um, then uh, HPSS, um, they're group writable, readable as well. Um, there are some collaboration accounts. Um, these uh, are ways for collaborations to get access to um, certain, you know, uh, large storage spaces and so forth. Um, if you have one of these, you may uh, be the one in control of, of that access and, and you're responsible for managing that. Um, and then Scratch um, is actually, um, uh, okay, so it's it's read only. That's what I figured. Um, but there are ways that you can make certain files um, or, or give certain files to people if you want them to have access. Um, so you can either use the, the Chmod, this is like for changing permissions on files, um, or you can, uh, there's also a way to move things, um, make things sort of readable given certain names or, or certain groups and so forth. Um, so we have, um, we, we have more details about this in our documentation, um, but it might be a good idea if you're concerned about this to go through and read that documentation and understand what the defaults are. And then a really, really useful thing we have is this give take um, uh, utility. So this is a way to actually you just, on the command line could say give and then uh, the name of the, the person you wanna give it to and the file, and you will be able to 
they'll they'll get get an email to whichever email they have associated with NERSC and uh, they'll know, hey, so-and-so gave you this file. And this is a really easy way to send or give people, give people permission without having to manage it yourself. And then the other person will just go into Perlmutter and uh, take the file that you gave them. Uh, yeah, so this is how that is done. Um, and again, this is in our uh, documentation as well. Um, there's a couple options for sharing with external collaborators, and I won't go into full details because um, there some of these require a little bit more work. Um, and so the full the best way to get the information is to use the full documentation uh, to read about and just follow the steps. Um, but there is a way to create a um, uh, 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 a web page, and you can uh, host your data there. Um, there are science gateways. This is something that Rebecca had mentioned. Um, you can use SPIN to basically host like a database or another way to share your data. And then we also use Globus for sharing data. So this is a really powerful um, and very uh, secure method for um, sending data over the internet to different people. Um, it is a little involved and it requires a little bit of setup. Um, so I would recommend um, if you need to be sending data, moving large amounts of data, um, familiarizing yourself with Globus. And again, all of these things, you know, if you're trying to use them and you need help, there are people who will help you set this up um, so that you can be successful. Um, <clears throat> okay. We also have these very special things called data transfer nodes. Um, these are dedicated to moving data uh, at NERSC, to, to NERSC, so forth. Um, and uh, there are special nodes that are actually accessed by logging into them directly. There's a, a few of them. Um, and they have direct, direct access to um, the community file system and HPSS. So this is a good way if you're moving, if you need to move large amounts of data, especially between other major facilities, um, you can use these, uh, you can you basically SCP through these uh, data transfer nodes because they'll be very fast um, and secure. Um, and they're really just meant for doing this, this one kind of thing. Um, okay, so I'm not going to go into detail about using Globus because I would want you to um, use the documentation for that reason. Um, but just know that we do support it. We have lots of resources for you. And um, it's a really great tool. It has like drag and drop features. Um, so it makes uh, transferring data, especially large amounts of data, pretty easy uh, in and out of the system. Okay, so we're not going to go through all of that. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a little uh, overview of all of our different options. Um, if you uh, are ever confused, uh, you're welcome to, you know, take a take a screenshot of this, keep it around. It's kind of just meant to reiterate all the things I've said about what are the different options, how do you use them, um, and uh, you know which one is big, which one is small, which one should I be using for different reasons, and and so forth. So yeah, so thank you so much. Um, again, you know, this is meant to be kind of a, a quick overview uh, of all of the different storage options. Um, hopefully I uh, went through and told you about um, which ones you should be using during your active computation, which ones you should be using uh, when you just need to store stuff, um, but you're always welcome to ask us questions if you are confused or not sure which one is the best option for what you're trying to do. And we will, happily answer those questions for you.